my father, he tells this story about how my grandfather took him on the bus in the old city of Jerusalem. The story goes that when my father was young, my grandfather was actually trying to teach him valuable life lessons. And in one of these valuable life lessons, he took him on the bus, and they went through all the different bus stops in some of the Arab and Muslim neighborhoods. Uh, and as they went through all these bus stops, my father says he would sit there, and he would watch my grandfather telling jokes in Arabic to some of the local Arab Bedouins that would get on this bus. My grandfather actually spoke seven different languages, including several dialects of Arabic, so it was actually very easy for him to be able to sit there and entertain the crowd on this bus. And of course, when they got to the end of the stop, at the end of their route, my grandfather grabbed my father, and they were getting ready to, to leave. And an Arab Bedouin stopped my grandfather, and he asked him, Shu Esmak, which is Arabic, for what is your name? And my grandfather smiled, and he said, Shlomo. Now, Shlomo is actually a very common Hebrew name. And this is roughly 1955, so there was just as much tension between some of the local Jews and some of the local Arabs in that region as there is today. So this left some of these Arab Bedouins a little bit confused, because here's a man that looks like them, talks like them, takes the bus in their local neighborhoods, and yet this Arab said to my grandfather, well, Shlomo, that's, that's a Hebrew name. And my grandfather smiled, and he said, yes, I'm Jewish. But that information doesn't make me any less funny. Now, I love that story, because what my grandfather was actually trying to show my father is that an Arab and a Jew, they can sit together, and they can laugh together. When you set aside things like religion, politics, land ownership, he was just trying to show them humanity at its authenticity. And the beauty of it is that I got to experience a similar thing later on in my life. Now, I want to kind of break the ice here. So by show of hands, how many of you here today have actually painted or drawn something at one point in your life, whether you painted for a gallery, a school project, maybe you just doodled a Mother's Day card, maybe you tattooed your mother out of... Nobody's judging, come on. <laughs> okay, nearly everybody. That's fantastic. And there's a reason for that, and it's because art is a language. It is a language we all here learned at a very early age. Most of you here picked up a crayon, or as in my case, even ate them, and you doodled something on paper well before you ever learned to talk. It is how we express ourselves without having to speak. Art is the language of the heart. It is, at the end of the day, how we express our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, without having to do those things verbally. And the beauty of it is that it is understood by people all around the world every single day. Now, it could be a beautiful language. It could be an ugly language. Sometimes it can be a hateful language, and sometimes it can be an inspiring language. Art has a way of expressing things so beautifully that sometimes they just can't be expressed in words. Now, I found out that I can actually communicate with people through art. Even here in Sweden, I've been living here for roughly about two years, and I still don't know anything beyond good moron. And I've realized that I can actually have a discussion with people in conversation without having to speak directly to them. It first came to my attention right here in Gothenburg. I actually painted a black dollar horse on Vastraham Gothan. There was nothing necessarily interesting about this horse, but what was fascinating was that over the next few days, people began to leave little notes right next to this horse. It began with one person who actually left a little note, and for those who can read Swedish here can see, he was actually questioning whether or not my horse's neck was anatomically correct. Street art critics. <laughs> but what was fascinating was that over the next few days and eventually next few weeks, more and more people began to leave more sticky notes. <laughs> and eventually, somebody who clearly seemed to have been frustrated at, with this discussion and wanted to settle the dispute once and for all actually stapled a tape measure right next to the horse. <laughs> To be honest, I don't know who carries a stapler and a tape measure in their purse, besides maybe MacGyver, but there you go. But that is the beauty of art, and more importantly, that is the power of public art. It enriches your community, it forces you to break away from your routine. Each of you can be on your way to work, on your way to the gym, and one day you'll see something on a wall, something that might make you smile, might make you think, might make you just want to complain about a neck, and make you dig into your purse, dig into your bag, and join a conversation, especially when it's something that's put there, out there illegally. That's the power of art. Now, I moved to the United States from Israel 
1989. I lived both in Los Angeles and in New York, as the moderator said. And in uh, 2010, I actually moved right here to Sweden. So as you can imagine, crossed quite a few borders before I ended up right on the stage. But earlier this year, I crossed a border into a place that most of my family and friends never have and never will actually get a chance to cross. In May 2012, a dear friend of mine, David Fried, was in Abu Tor in Jerusalem. And David has been out there through a nonprofit organization, through teaching photography and journalism to some of the local youths there. And at some point, David reached out to me and asked me what I felt about traveling to the Middle East region to paint on the famous wall that separates the country of Israel and the country of Palestine. Now, being originally from Israel, I thought to myself, well, let's see, I have family there. It's quite a short trip from Gothenburg Airport, and frankly, for anybody who's been living in Sweden, we could really use some sun. So I said, why not? No problem. But a few email exchanges later, it became aware that David actually wanted to film this for a documentary film called Art on the Scene. So he actually wanted me to paint on the Palestinian side of the wall for this documentary. That could be a little bit of a problem, because unless you've lived under a rock for, I don't know, 2,000 years, it doesn't take a lot of research to know that things have been quite conflicted there for quite some time. Prior to going to this project, I knew actually two things for sure. The first thing I knew was that entering Palestine as an Israeli citizen is against the law. It's against the law. There's no alternatives, no loopholes, you just can't do it. The second thing I knew was that if I was actually going to try to pull this off, I'm going to need one hell of a miracle at convincing my wife to let me get on that plane. Now, one of the real challenges of this trip was actually entering Palestine, because as I said, for somebody like me, an Israeli citizen, you just can't do it. And to get into Palestine, into West Bank, you actually have to go through checkpoints, three in fact on the way in and three on the way out. Each checkpoint requires you to show a passport, answer questions, deal with Israeli military. So this is all before you even get into West Bank. So it's very stressful and quite nerve-wracking. But it was well worth it for what I found inside. Because once I got in there, I saw this wall, the barrier. It stretches for 750 kilometers. 10% of that, 75 kilometers, is this pure concrete nine-meter-high wall. Every 400 meters are these guard towers. And these guard towers are heavily armed IDF military, whose sole purpose is to keep an eye out for any suspicious activity happening by the wall. And here I was with David, planning to paint on it. Should be easy, right? So now the wall there is put there, actually, to keep peace and order in that region. I mean, its sole purpose of this wall is to keep, prevent suicide bombings from happening. And it has actually shown that since this wall has gone up, suicide bombings in that region have actually declined. In fact, from 2000 to July 2003, 73 suicide bombings occurred, resulting in 293 Israeli deaths. But from August 2003, which is a little bit after the construction of the wall began, to the end of 2006, only 12 suicide bombings happened, resulting in 64 deaths. So the wall is actually helping preventing suicide bombings from happening. But it's also preventing something else entirely that I found out once I got in there. It's preventing hope from reaching the people of Palestine. I want to actually try to put this in a little bit of better context for everyone. I want everybody here, and who's ever watching, streaming, um, to think back to your childhood or even your teen years. Think about what it is that you aspire to be growing up. Perhaps you want to be an astronaut, be a police officer, or maybe a firefighter. Think about what it is that you wanted to be. A good guess would be that the majority of us here today didn't get to become what our childhood dream was. Maybe you wanted to be an astronaut and you became a veterinarian. Maybe you wanted to be a police officer and you became a brain surgeon. Most of us didn't get to become what our childhood dream was, not because we didn't have access to the education or training that is required to achieve those goals. Most of us had access to that. We just chose to do something different. Perhaps our environment changed. Maybe our dreams just simply changed. But each of you always had a choice. But not everyone has the luxury of choice. This is Khalid. And Khalid lives in a small neighborhood outside of Ramallah. He's in his teens, and when Khalid was asked what he would like to be when he grows up, 
he said he wants to be an Air Force pilot. That's a good dream to have. Some of you here might have even shared that same dream when you were his age. But Khalid won't get to be an Air Force pilot. Because Khalid lives in a country that has no airport, has no Air Force. There are no planes in the sky, there are no planes on the ground. The only way for Khalid to be able to get the education and training that's required for him to become a pilot, he would have to go through the same series of checkpoints that I had to go through. And believe me when I tell you, it's twice as difficult for him as it was for me. Here's a kid, just a kid, who wants to be a pilot. And the wall that's there to keep peace and order in that region is preventing him from having a choice. Most Palestinian people don't travel outside of their own neighborhood, and it's not because they don't want to. It's because they can't. But you have to remember that art has power has a power to change an environment, whether it's right here on a corner in Gothenburg, or has a power to change an entire culture. I spent three days inside Palestine with David, and over those three days, I got to meet some of the locals. Their kids, had coffee with them, their elders. And at one point, I met a man and his two sons, and they owned the Banksy shop. For those here who don't know who Banksy is, he's a world-renowned street artist, probably the most recognized name in the street art culture today. And Banksy actually did travel in 2007 to West Bank and Ramallah as well, and left quite beautiful and remarkable murals on that wall as well. And here you have Bethlehem, home to the Church of Nativity. Tour buses are coming in through those checkpoints by the busloads with security and going directly down to the church and take pictures of all of its nativity. And a good portion of those tourists, as soon as they're done, they turn around and they ask, where are the Banksies? The art on that wall, illegal art on that wall, has become part of the Palestinian culture, part of their tourist attraction. So a lot of these people who live in Palestine, who had no choice about this wall going up, had to look at this wall and ask if there was anything, anything at all, that it can do to benefit their lives. In the case of that man and his two sons, they chose to build a family business out of art that was put on their wall right outside their homes illegally. This shows that time is changing and that art has helped changing it. I'm actually currently living in Bros. Yeah, I see those faces, Bros. And most of you know Bros as that little city with a lot of clouds over it. It's <laughs> um, and I moved there about almost two years ago. And earlier this summer, I was actually asked by the city of Bros and the museum to do a permanent mural right inside the city center, which is kind of ironic, because I've actually been doing those dollar horses throughout Bros for the first year and a half I've lived there, illegally without permission. And now here I was asked by the city and the museum to add a permanent fixture into the city center. So it was quite an honor. And I was sitting there painting this mural, and at some point, a police car drove by inside what I was doing. It was Friday night. So they turned on their lights, and they sped up, and they parked their police car right in front of me, like, you know, I'm going to try to outrun them at age 33. <laughs> and these officers asked me what I was doing, and I explained to them, I'm painting. And this very confused look fell on their faces. I think, to be honest, I personally think they expected me to run. I mean, let's be honest. Graffiti artists, street artists, we tend to run. We don't stand around and start confessing probably in their Swedish police academy handbook. Things that run, number one, street artists. Uh, <laughs> right up between hooliganism and whatever. Um, so I explained to these nice officers what this was, that I had permission, and it was commissioned through the city. And as they were getting into their car, one of these nice officers turned around and said, well, you know, it's Friday night, there's a bar right behind you. It's getting kind of late. If any of you drunks bother you, give us a call. That's nice. I mean, I just came back from Palestine. I think I can happen to a couple of drunks in Bros, but thanks. <laughs> and these nice officers left. And not even 90 seconds after they left, I kid you not, these two young, and God bless them, very drunk guys came from that bar behind me, and one of them says, are those cops bothering you? Because we can totally have your back. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of great. I mean, here you have everybody playing a hero, 
the cops warning me about the drunks, the drunks warning me about the cops. Everybody is a hero at protecting what, under Swedish law, is considered vandalism under any other circumstances. A total side note, and I apologize to the TEDx guys, but I have to share this story. When I was painting this wall, it was actually over the course of a weekend, <laughs> so people could actually come and ask questions. And at one point, this family, this Scottish family, came by, and it was a mom and her two twin daughters, red hair, braided, freckles. It was adorable. And, <laughs> and I'm talking to the mom and explaining to her what this mural was and what I was doing and why I choose to paint dollar horses. And as we're talking, her little doll daughter points at the horse and says, Mama, Mama, red horsey. We're like, wow, that's quite observant of you. That's, that's fantastic. And the mom tried to explain to her, well, yes, dear, but it's a Swedish dollar horse. It has historic value. It's, it, it's tradition. It you know, has cultural attachment to Swedish culture. And I noticed from the corner of my eye, as she's telling this to her little daughter, her daughter starts shaking her head. And then she goes, no, that's not it. That horsey is just sick. <laughs> now, that really is, shows what kind of language art is. I mean, it is speaking something completely different to her than it does to you and I. We know the traditional factor of it. We know the culture stamp it is. For her, that horse is just sick. I, I swear, I should put that on business cards. Shai Dahan, painter of sick horses. Probably make a killing with that, right? So, what do I want to leave you with? I want to leave you with today to look at art outside a little bit differently. You know, it's, nobody here has to actually be an artist to learn how to facilitate it. You just have to recognize the power that it has. My, my art, or anybody's art, on that wall in Palestine is small. When you compare it to the impact that it has on the people who are living there. You know, there's so many things in this world that cause conflict, that separate us. Let art be that language that brings us together that common language that unifies us. You know, I entered Palestine both as an Israeli citizen as well as an artist, but the way I chose to communicate with the people of Palestine was through my art. So just like my grandfather on that bus, we chose to communicate in a language we both spoke, and because of that, conflict ceased to exist for us for three days. My art on that wall is temporary. That wall is temporary. And after spending three days of having coffee and laughing and joking with the people of Palestine, I truly believe that the conflict there can also be temporary. Fear forces us all to build up walls. Hope can give you all the strength to tear them down. But until you all find the strength to tear down those walls, I plan to paint on them, and I think you should too. Thank you very much.